for me, it's been a real personal and intellectual journey, one that I think has started here and also finished here. It was three years ago that I came and stood in a room just down the corridor and was met by a sea of strange faces. I didn't know anybody bar one person who was involved. Over the course of three years, those strangers have become colleagues, friends, but also family. We are part of the open air family. And this family spans north, south, east and west, across Africa and beyond. And all of you are in some way part of that family. And now we are coming to the end of what is part one of the scenario project. And we are hoping that you're sufficiently interested that you will now take this forward to part two, part three, or whatever. Everything we show you now is in the compendium. If you want to follow me, um, you can as we go, or otherwise you will find these images, everything, um, in the document you have in your hands. So a network is a network, and open air is a network of networks. But ultimately, networks are meaningless unless the people inside them have something to offer. And that truly is what open air is about. The tacit knowledge in all of those heads that have combined together to create something which is truly greater than the sum of the parts. All of those people, knowledge and innovation is about people and what's inside people's heads. And these scenarios that we've made are truly a combination of everybody's thinking. Everybody's thinking, all of the research that was undertaken and that you heard about yesterday, all of the documents that each and every one of, re of us have read and studied, and you can see some of them in the references to the actual compendium. Our project was truly daunting when we started. We came to the first workshop and we were trying to understand what the relationship was between progress and development, information, technology, and openness, knowledge and innovation, and on top of all of that, the role of intellectual property for Africa. And anybody who spent any time in Africa knows that Africa is a very diverse continent. Where do you start? Um, as this particular image shows, Africa's got many identities and every African country has chosen a different identity to express in the stamps that are now kind of a historic item. But as Kapuczynski described, Africa is really a figment of our imagination. There are many Africas. For every commonality, there is a difference. So please, a wo word of caution. We've, these are pan-African scenarios, but there are still as many differences as there are similarities. But still, they create a framework within which you can start exploring your particular context. So then we asked ourselves some really difficult questions. What does development mean? What is, pro what is progress? What kind of knowledge? Oh, I've forgotten. How is knowledge governed? And importantly, what is the context? How does this context shape the answers? <clears throat> now, before you actually look to the future, you have to know where you are in the present, where you are on the map. What is the current reality? And as we started the exercise, it became apparent that the current reality was very, very complex. 
more complex because everybody else had told Africa's story rather than Africa itself, as this quote of Achebe so beautifully puts it. We also learned that for many years, over the, over the centuries, Africa's been a place that nobody has really known too much about. This is the first ever map of the whole African continent. It was drawn in 1564 by Sebastian Munster. And yet, seeing as we're talking about knowledge and innovation, a hundred years later, that's a full century later, the geographer royal of, of France declared that Africa was part of Europe. So, knowledge depends on perspective. Sorry, I'll just go back to that for a moment. What we also learned during history is that this context matters. When we talk about appropriate technologies, it will depend on the context, as Fernando has explained to us a moment ago. We also learned that information and technology are time-bound. 13 centuries BC, there was a Suez Canal, and it was only when Napoleon started exploring in 1799 that the idea of a Suez, second Suez Canal became apparent. So knowledge and technology can be lost. It isn't static process at all. We also learned that the remnants of knowledge and innovation become culture. Get, get stuck in culture and identity. So long after something is no longer appropriate, it is embedded within the culture itself. But what we also learned is that in Africa's long history, there have been countless disruptions that have pushed and changed the context. And these disruptive forces, there are several different types. One, as Fernando had explained a moment ago, is technology. It's the one we think about. And through history, technology has changed the context. But it's not the only one. Other, there, are, there are other disruptors. And most importantly, and something that maybe Africans understand more about than many, parts, many other parts of the world, is the environment. Great Zimbabwe, <coughs> was a civilization that flourished for centuries and disappeared overnight, virtually, due to environmental pressures. Um, and there are also what we call wild cards and shocks. Slavery, colonialism, but also just conflict that can change the environment and the context overnight. So what are scenarios? Scenarios are basically a set of different lenses with which to view the world. And here are three maps of the world overlaid. If you look, the bottom yellow one, maybe it's orange to you, is the traditional Mercator map that has been used, which was for many years fit for purpose. At its base, uh, the, the concept behind the Mercator map is actually locating true north. So for the navigators sailing the seas, it was the perfect map. But as you can see, it shrinks Africa, Africans, uh, the size of Africa. It doesn't give you any concept of this actual landmass of Africa. As one can see, if you look at the Peter's map, the brown map, which is overlaid on top of it. And then, like any good politician, there's an in-between, the Robinson map, which takes a bit of Mercator, a bit of Peter's, and puts the two together. What we want to show with these three maps overlaid is that the map and the mindset behind it 
defines the landscape. Neither, none of these maps is wrong, but none of them is right. And so, by having more than one map, you are actually in a better position and understand the whole better than you would if you only had one map. Okay? And basically, that is what scenarios are about. Maps, behind any map or scenario, is a set of assumptions and a set of mental models, which are the working, which have created the lens with which one actually views the world. So, that was a brief gallop through what is a long part of the compendium, the current reality, the perspective. We then come to driving forces. So when we stand today and we look to the future, what might change? What might impact upon Africa's future over the next 20 years? The date we picked was 2035. And these are our drivers of change. And of these drivers of change, the many, many things we discussed and had many <laughs> workshops about, we distilled them down to five. Now, if anybody wants to follow that, it's page 7071 in your compendiums themselves. So. We have five driving forces. The first one is global relationships. And that's really about the interconnections and the interdependencies that span a global world, that, or distance them, bring people together or pull them apart. And the question we asked ourselves was, would these relationships be collaborative, competitive, or coercive? And as importantly, who benefited from these relationships? Our next driving force is statehood and governance, the role of the state in relation to its citizens, and how to balance the innate tensions between individual rights and freedoms and state power. And the question we asked ourselves, will these relationships be cohesive, challenging, or communal? And again, Whose interests will they serve? Our third driving force is identities and differences, the values that evolve in the face of social, political, and economic changes that are taking place at every level, global, communal, and also individual. And the question we asked ourselves, will people, individuals, communities, adopt multiple identities? Will there be fluidity or will there be stability as we go forward? And then we talk about infrastructure and technology, those disruptive enablers that Fernando explained and talked about a moment ago, that enable Africa to leapfrog conventional structures and create new methods to disrupt the status quo. And the question is that these investments in technology and infrastructure, will they be inclusive? Would we otherwise have an ad hoc, add-on set um, of infrastructural solutions? Will they be reconceived? And if so, in what way? The next question we asked ourselves and the final driving force is one that is so often overlooked. In Africa, with its demographic dividend, which means, as Fernando was explaining, lots and lots of young people, where do the jobs come from? How will these people be employed? Is, what is Africa's ability to create opportunities for this growing workforce, providing them a means to evolve and reduce poverty, create economic growth, social empowerment, and ideally also social cohesion. And the question we asked ourselves, will there be economic diversity? 
will Africa informalize more? Or will, they will Africa reconfigure itself in some different way? And then alongside those five driving forces, we realized that there were a whole series of p possible shocks. Shocks that could disrupt and push the system into something that is actually almost inconceivable. Or not. <laughs> anyway, from all of those musings and research and analysis done by a large group of scenario builders, many of whom are sitting in this room, we devised three scenarios which will be presented to you now. The first, wireless engagement. The second, informal, the new normal. And the third, Sincerely Africa. So, without more ado, let me present the three open-air scenarios. chosen as a test case in using the new, new resources and we were given a little bit of more attention than the others in the area and the teaching was better too. It was my teacher who helped me to apply for the international program funded by the Helping Hand Foundation. I was lucky they chose me. <laughs> they paid for everything. They paid for my studies and my living costs to go to boarding school in the city. You know it was hard for me at first because I was shy and I was teased a lot because I came from a different class. But I was driven and hungry to show that I could be a success too. And life for me now, ha, it's happening. And it all started here in Africa. Africa is a continent of abundance. Abundant with land, resources, sunshine, and beautiful people. You know, I've made some good connections. My friends now are everywhere, online, across the city, all over the world. And we work wherever we want to and wherever the work takes us. You know, being an entrepreneur is a tough game. It's, it's high risk. And I've seen many come and go because some people just can't keep up with the pace of change. To be ahead in the game, you have to stay two steps ahead of the competitors. Because what's cool today is late tomorrow. And when it's happening, and you're sitting at your desk, and life is just fine, and, and business is booming, and everything's just good. Oh, that's the ultimate high. But when you make the wrong move, you're dead meat. And, sorry, international call, sorry. James, <laughs> yes, no, we said to the papers, so, yeah, no, no, the deal is done. We just said to the papers. <laughs> I have lived in this village my whole life. Others have left, but I've been left behind. My parents didn't have money to send me to school, so I had to now work in the fields and, and take care of them. Um, even though I have nothing. Not like my brother. <laughs> he's, he's, he's the one who succeeded in our family. He, he finished school, left here, and 
and now he's too rich and important to even come and visit us. Once, he, he, once he, he gave me this, this, this new phone. It was, it, was, it was so fancy and everyone came to look at it. I didn't know how to use most of the things on the phone and I didn't want to ask my brother because he thinks I'm stupid. <laughs> but it's, it's true that I, that I had to teach myself how to read with my friend and I don't understand most of the words on the phone. But you know, this phone needs to always be recharged. And we don't have a generator and I don't want to ask the neighbors if they complain, always ask for money. So it's difficult. My brother said that I can go on the internet with the phone. He said that I just have to save a little bit of money and then I can go and see. But what is the internet really? I mean, how will it help my life and my future? My life is so far away from them. Away! My name is Nagla Riz and I'm working on the wireless engagement scenario with my uh, friends, with Toby, Naram and the rest of the team. And this is the world we try to describe and it's very well portrayed. I, it is a world of these African yuppies and the others, those who are left behind. I, uh, the color of our scenario is purple. I couldn't find a purple outfit, but I tried to look happy. <laughs> like I wrapped my shirt and I have my fancy, you know, f funky glasses. <laughs> So I tried. Uh, so this is a world where it's the wireless engagement. This is our typical representative of this scenario. The African educated, you know, the one who made use of the opportunities to learn. It is a world where technology, appropriate technologies have taken place. Africans have made very good use of uh, mobile technologies and we call it wireless engagement. Uh, they are, it's a world where uh, there are tons of opportunities for young people. It is, at the end of the day, male-dominated. There are some opportunities for women, but the culture still prevails. It is uh, a world where uh, we have um, uh, African enterprise is interconnected with the global uh, service-oriented economy, young business leaders from a vocal middle class, and citizens hold governments accountable. So the empowerment that takes place because of technologies, by the use of technologies, is also translated in better governance for society. It is not a rosy world because there's always, as Shireen calls it, this thing in the tail. There are those who are left behind. As Fernando has mentioned, there are those who will not have access to the phone, to, the, to charge their phones. So in some cases, actually, and I speak for in case of Egypt, for example, there are high rates of illiteracy. So the, the, not just um, technological illiteracy, but also education, basic read and write literacy, and these will stay in the way of um, uh, the inclusion that is uh, offered in this um, scenario. So uh, the uneducated or under-resourced individuals who cannot conform will, uh, to, to the technical, legal, and socioeconomic standards will be left behind. Um, it is also a world where um, knowledge, the, the value of knowledge, the valuable knowledge that is generated in Africa uh, that we are all, all aware of, it has a lot of informal uh, components, is actually geared towards the uh, formalization. The, the, the modes of operation, the modes of production are more, uh, the, the tensions between uh, IP are more moving towards more formal IP standards, more being part of what is going on globally. So in that sense, the tension is resolved uh, for the benefit of, um, uh, as we've seen, entrepreneurs who work with the formal economy, uh, with the Western world, more into Africa is more interconnected with the global um, environments. Uh, so then, what we see is also a world where um, uh, the, the uncertainties are how can we engage those who are left behind to become part of, the, uh, of this very dynamic, thriving world uh, where there's a stronger middle class, there are those who are moving up the scale by making use of those um, technologies. 
Uh, when we look also at um, uh, the cheetah generation, the cheetah generation is, uh, which was also mentioned by Fernando, is represented by our, um, uh, you know, the first, uh, the, the person we saw on the stage. But there are also um, uh, other members of the community who are not part of this. Uh, when we look at uh, global metrics for knowledge, Africa will rank better on formal metrics of knowledge as more formal knowledge is being produced. So when we think of indicators like um, uh, the World Bank a knowledge assessment matrix or innovation uh, in this global innovation indices of the um, NCAD and OECD measurements, we will see better um, uh, uh, performance by Africa on this um, scale. In that sense, there is um, also uh, an important part is the inclusion of or the, the brain train rather than uh, brain drain because these, these opportunities will also provide uh, chances to include Africans in that diaspora, businesses that benefit from uh, technological platforms in a way where you can have um, outsourcing services in this very much service-oriented economy, there Africa will be interconnected not only um, uh, culturally but also um, economically and um, business-wise. We will have uh, several opportunities offered um, uh, through uh, the, the digital, the global digital economy, where uh, really um, information is at its uh, peak. Resource curse is uh, moving to become a resource blessing. There is more awareness of how to engage uh, with foreign partners and how to negotiate with the global community thanks to the better education and uh, the inclusion into a more open, um, um, internationally open education-wise and technology-wise. Uh, so within this world of, of wireless <coughs> engagement, there remain uh, other challenges. There are uncertainties about the future. There are uncertainties about um, the educational opportunities for the, uh, for the less fortunate. How to narrow the digital divide. How to ensure better governance translates into inclusive development. How to design educational systems that teach standard skills, but also encourage experimentation and critical thinking. Education, uh, usually education metrics will only show quantities and not quality. So how the challenge then is how can uh, Africa uh, work to improve the uh, quality of education in a way that makes enables its youth to make opportunities of um, better opportunities of knowledge uh, utilization. Uh, when we think of the uh, wireless engagement, of this very rich, dynamic entrepreneurial environment, technology, uh, technologies being uh, developed, uh, will we have uh, like technology valleys or savannah, um, Silicon Savannah, as we call it, quote unquote, will that be will that be the same in in you know uh, far out there in time as what we have seen in in the West, or would that be a new model of technology valleys that is very different and unique to uh, to Africa? Uh, so, would African innovation hubs be distinct? How can the tensions between proprietary and open business models and associated policy frameworks be resolved in Africa's favor? In fact, I'm also thinking of Fernando's earlier words and how, what are the appropriate technologies that will continue to push uh, Africa forward in that context. So in all of this, when we look at uh, um, inclusive education, overall better economic and political engagement and performance by, by some, but not all, when we look at uh, the positive uh, indicators of uh, knowledge uh, production, technology, dynamic businesses, and thriving uh, young community, we should also uh, not overlook those who are left behind. And the main challenge in this context is how can we think ahead, should that scenario materialize, how can we prepare as policy makers, as research community, as, uh, you know, as civil society members, how would we prepare for this scenario in a way that we ensure that we reap the, the benefits and the positive and, you know, uh, outputs and uh, try to tackle and be prepared for the challenges from now and keep an eye on that. Thank you very much. And nobody seems to be under Oh, there is fire on the mountain top Man. and no one is around. Hey, hello. <laughs> there is fire on the mountain top and nobody seems to be under us. Oh, there is fire on the mountain top, and no one is running. It's beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> Can I help you? Yes, yes, you're right. You work on this design.
time anywhere else in the market. Each one is unique. I produce my fashions from home, and my mother and my two cousins, they sell my designs for me. <laughs> okay. oh, I get my material from Italy and China, and some also from America. And my jewelry, I get from South Africa. And my shoes are the best Nigerian leather. Everything comes from someone I know. We know each other. We love each other. We trust each other. So I can guarantee you top quality. <laughs> Don't worry. If it doesn't fit, you can always make you something else by tomorrow. Or maybe the next day. Otherwise, I can take you to my sister's store. She's just around the corner, but don't worry, I'll take you. You have to find things now that we're starting again. Some big shops, so-called developers, they put money in government pockets and then they think they can just do what they like. They came to us with these, these big raiders, these, these trucks, and they wanted to break down our stores. They said they had official papers from the government saying that we were trespassing. Trespassing! When my family has had a store here for years, we paid our rents every week, just as the head of the Traders Association. We lost everything, but we knew how to fight back, and we knew who to ask for help, and our customers, they fight for us. The men in the big suits were back yesterday. They were talking about health and safety and planning regulations, but do you think the government will give us cheaper water and electricity? I spend almost 20% of the money I make on water and electricity. And the government, they want us to pay. For what? We take care of ourselves. And they, they just give us papers. But <laughs> I'm talking too much. You, you want to buy the original? Hey, you can see my work in the papers. Stars, stars were my designs. And you can too, my sister. <laughs> I work in the Ministry of Finance. <laughs> it is a job. It pays the bills. And I must not complain. <sighs> this job is a burden. It's a heavy weight on my life. I pay my taxes. Even though they take more and more every year. Everybody wants more from the government. And they complain because they don't like what they see. Where are those people who put their hands in their pockets and pay the taxes? Now, I've been doing this job for 15 years now. And every year, we have to give these international people all this information so that they can rent our country for what they call the cost of doing business. <coughs> Our minister says we are doing the right thing to increase efficiency and meet global standards. On the news, they argue that the costs of regulation and tax is too complicated and too much. That the only thing that matters is jobs. Now, we don't really have borders between our countries. All the rules have changed. Nothing is stable anymore. It's even the same at work. I hear talk about us merging with other countries in this region. So I might not even have a job tomorrow. Ah, this government seems to be a joke that everyone is laughing at. I'm now part of that joke. There is fire on the mountain. And nobody seems to be under an Asiatic. There is fire on the mountain top, and no one is around. This lady will disappear. That eventually will end up with only institutions, organizations that represent this gentleman. And probably many of you in this room believe that and continue telling yourself that this lady has more business will eventually disappear. Well, she's not going anywhere. This picture was taken 
in one of the, on one of the streets in Kampala. So Mr. Fernando, that is Kampala for you. <laughs> Many of you have been to London, New York, Geneva. Many times stuck in traffic, wanting to get to that next meeting, and wondering how you can actually run through. Well, in Kampala, it works. How? You see the border border man on the left. There's one motorcycle and a bike. That guy will get you from one part of the city to another faster than an F-16. <laughs> you see the man with the merchandise on the left and the shop on the right. Well, that guy picked that merchandise from that shop in the morning. So they are not working against each other. They are working for each other. They are related. You see the cars in the picture? Well, again, if you've been to New York, Geneva, London, you know that cars move in a straight line. There's a lane. Not in Kampala. And we love it because it works, right? So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this world. Informal, the new normal. And tell you what, who can guess who coined this term? It is not ours. We just came across this in the literature. Anyone? Informal, the new normal. It is the World Bank. That means you guys have not read the World Bank report for 2013. <laughs> so the World Bank thinks this is the new norm. And it is. It has been for a long time. Only that we decided to ignore it. We hoped it would go away. And we continue to think it will. It will. Only that it's not. So in this world, you are dealing with informal Businesses, informal relationships, informal institutions, informal communities. Trust is key. Relationships are important. Who you know is what matters. It's not this guy in sorts and government institutions and bureaucracies and, you know, all those important people or seemingly important people. They don't matter. It is this woman who knows where the fabrics are. She knows the small shops where you are going to get those buttons to make the fabric. If you want something done, she knows how to do it. It's not this man here who tries to pretend to be important. That is not what we are talking about in this world. Well, trust, as I mentioned, is important. We are dynamic, we value innovation. We have to think fast. If we don't, that man on the other corner is going to do it. And obviously, you will be wiped, wiped out. Even in a single day, your business will be gone. Your reputation is what matters. Not the number of patents you have registered with uh, Mr. Fernando's office, no. They don't matter. They are just numbers. Your reputation is what is important. How you repaired that car? Is it running? Did you put in, put in the good part? Right? So that is what is important. Of course, there are uncertainties, there are challenges. In this or this orderly world, we don't know how we will organize ourselves. We don't know how the informal financial services, you know, we talk about M-Pesa, that's what we use. We don't know how that is going to work. But it will work. We will make it work. It is an uncertainty, but we will figure it out. Of course, the government is still important. Of course, the uh, formal sector is still important. We use M-Pesa. We don't know where the money comes from, where it goes. But we know Safaricom, which owns this business, of M-Pesa, 
has an account with Standard Chartered Bank. Actually, that money you transfer from one location to another using M-Pesa, there is an escrow account in Standard Chartered Bank. It is actually backed up by real account somewhere. <coughs> so this bank is still important. But we don't care about the bank. We do care that money leaves Nairobi and goes to Naivasha, which is obviously a small city, right? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Informo, the new normal. It is not going away. Thank you very much. I came back home and I realized that I could not get back in the city. Despite my qualification, everything goes to the foreigners. And the government doesn't even care. I was never part of the xenophobia. But many of the young men were fighting and killing each other. I understand that they are angry and frustrated like me. But that violence hurts no one. Since I've returned home, I've made some good friends. And we are making changes to our community to benefit everyone. We are using collectives to give us better negotiating powers so we can make the more expensive changes that we need. Allowing the, the women more power was difficult for the older ones. <laughs> but they are the best crop farmers here and they bring in the profits. 
We are always trying to, to do something new. But water is scarce. So our biggest challenge now is to do more with less. My grandmother always used to say that she's so happy now with the family here and everyone helping her. I'm glad that I can do this. Sometimes I wonder what life could have been like if, if I was working in the city. Would I have had a nice job? Or would I have been able to go and travel all the places? You know, when I was young, I used to look at maps and imagine all the places my success would take me. But who would have thought it would have just brought me home? Welcome to Sicily, Africa. This is Africa where we now go back to the basics, where external pressures have forced us back home. And we have begun to re-engage with our core traditional values. We are reviving our traditional knowledge and practices. The elders and the youths are having a concert of progress. And we are taking our destiny in our own hands. And how did we get there, if we may ask? Well, Fernando was right. In the year 2050, we will achieve that target. The population would have exploded. There will be exponential factor. May I tell you that the amount of food wasted in North America and Europe combined in a year is equal to what we produce in Sub-Saharan Africa. Dare I to tell you that if everybody was to leave the average lifestyle of one American, one resident of America, then we will need four Earths to sustain ourselves. So there is a problem, and we have to go back. This is the world of Sincerely Africa. We have challenges. Economics have told us there will be some time we've been talking about growth, growth, growth. We are coming to a stage where we might have a no growth economy. And there will be challenges, environmental sustainability, climate change. They will push us to the brink. We're not going to be talking about how much is your GDP. We're going to be talking about the level of happiness Life will be sustainable in communities, not in the city centers. Our challenges will be those of food security, environmental sustainability, and population health. And therefore, we will be resorting to the stewardship of the ecosystem. We'll be reviving our communities. We'll be looking for ways to sustain ourselves. But some people will be excluded in this system. Make no mistakes about it. As we have been talking about diversity of Africa, those that do not have solid social cultural connections with the land, the culture, and the people, they are the most vulnerable in this Africa that is likely to unfold. In case you are doubting me, recall what Sharon said. These are three maps. None of them is completely correct. None of them is flatly wrong. They have a way of intersecting. But we have uncertainties in Sincerely Africa. And one of the challenges we'll face is how we can successfully manage historical and emerging racial and religious challenges. Make no mistakes about it. When people start retreating home, we might begin to revive so-called values, family values, 
might endanger people with different sexual orientation. There might be tensions. There might be street justice in this world that is about to unfold. Another challenge we'll face will be how we could collectively manage our shared environmental resources and traditional heritage. How in this world could we actually avoid the tragedy of the commons? And also, because our traditional knowledge systems are being revived, definitely we will have to contend with how to preserve them and to ward off external interests. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the world we are being called to live. And to make it even look like we are seeing the faint signals, even as we speak, land grabs. A number of lands, prime agricultural lands in Africa, has been taken over in the last several years. And more, as I speak, they think that we can grow ourselves out of this exponential crisis that is about to happen. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to go back to the basics in order to survive this. This is the world of Sincerely Africa. Thank you.